on to the final day of IDEA Summer Institute. Um, we're getting started today with Dr. Rick Carley, who's presenting about efficient overtime analysis of social network data sets. And so Dr. Carley, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. I will go ahead and start screen sharing here. All right, so you should see my slides. Um, let me uh, uh, welcome you to the last day. So we're going to talk about time in this uh, next hour and a half lecture. So we're we're very interested in the effect of time and, and what it means for analysis and how we do analysis and, and what sorts of things do we do with network data sets over time. So that's the, the, the basic idea. Uh -huh. There we go. Um, yeah, so real networks are not static. Um, we, we often talk about them as though they're static, but real networks, meaning uh, human networks, um, networks of computers could be static, but uh, human networks are dynamic because human beings are dynamic. And so almost all of this uh, discussion in this uh, lecture section today will really be focused on human networks. So these are networks of human beings that are interacting. And, and we'll talk about some of the issues and uh, go through some examples of, of how to do uh, comparisons of over time data sets. In particular, we'll talk about something that's usually labeled change detection. So we're going to be looking for sudden changes in structure. Those usually indicate some abnormal event has happened, um, like an earthquake or a revolution or some political upheaval or something has happened. Um, and, and so we want to talk about doing that and doing it efficiently and finally, we'll end with a discussion of doing that kind of detection of changes using measures of social networks rather than the social networks themselves. Um, and so in, in the beginning, we want to just think of how do social dynamics work? Um, people interact with other people. People have choices and options in, to interact. They choose to interact on a lot of different things. We'll talk about homophily, which just says you like to interact with people who are more like you. And of course, it's even more complicated because you like to interact with people you perceive as being more like you, even if they're not actually. So we have to think about where do you get your mental model for those others that you're going to interact with. It's a very complex thing. We're only going to touch the surface on that because our focus is really just how do we handle this change over time in terms of the in analysis techniques. So that's that's the structure and we can basically break it down into two broad sweeps. There's natural evolution, which I already talked about. Humans interact on a daily basis. Each one of them changes their mental perception of other people. Each one of them changes their own views on various issues. That'll change their propensity to interact with other people based on homophily. Um, there are other things that happen though, like you're fired from your job. There's an earthquake. Um, you know, there's uh, some political upheaval. So there, there can be other things that are sudden shock events, and we can think of them as interventions or, or disturbances that cause a sudden shift in everyone's network structure at the same time. Those are very interesting things. We are extremely interested in the, in the role of analysts uh, analysts looking at a particular social media surrounding a particular venue are very interested in detecting that something 
dramatic has happened. So those shock events are very important. So we'd like to think about how to find them. And so if you think about studying overtime data sets, you, you can think about sort of looking at the past and comparing it with now. You can carry out statistics on now. You can decide something interesting happened and then start collecting new statistics in order to determine what the near term impact of that was. So there's a lot of different kinds of studies that could be done on overtime networks, but it starts by figuring out, oh, there was an interesting event that happened at a particular point in time. Um, we call those longitudinal networks. That just means over time. Every time point is really an aggregate of a range of times. And we take all of the network interactions that happened in that range of times and we connect them to, and, and aggregate them into a single network. And then we have uh, individual networks that correspond with those time windows. Let's call those windows in time. So each one of those windows in time, we build a network. And so we look at these networks and we say to ourselves, well, oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, something pretty dramatic happened to the network at this point in time between like here, then here, then here. It's like everybody died or something. This is, you know, must have been some catastrophic disaster in this organization. Um, and, and of course, I haven't told you how far apart these time points are. That might be important in your in interpretation. Um, and, and in fact, in this particular case, uh, these time points are, are simply uh, every four hours. So this is represents four hours and this represents four hours and four hours and four hours, and four hours. This is four hours around noon and this is four hours in the middle of the night. And this is Twitter linkages and it just happens that there's a lot more traffic at noon. In a given geographic region than there is in the middle of the night. So this is not any nothing dramatic has happened to this organization. We call this a pattern of life periodicity. So something that can mess up our ability to just look at the networks and say when a change has happened or not happened is pattern of life variations. Now, obviously you could say that's no problem. You just collect Twitter data on a day by day basis because then you've aggregated, you know, all of these time periods back to noon and, and so if you aggregated every day the same way, then you wouldn't see this daily time variation. But then I would just point out to you, oh, that's interesting. Do you know the weekend? Do you know uh, uh, Fridays are important in cert certain parts of the world? And, uh, you know, so um, maybe you'd better aggregate for a whole week. And then, of course, there's monthly events and yearly events and decadal events, and pretty soon you can't aggregate at all. So this pattern of life periodicity is important. It, it has a dramatic impact on the network structure, but it's got nothing to do with the sudden change in the underlying organization. So we have to learn how to ignore it in our analysis if we want to be able to detect changes in the underlying organization at short time scales compared to these periodicities. We'll talk more about that. The other issue I didn't really come in on is there are also people or in, in any given society, we're doing analysis at a certain level of detail. And, and for any given society, there are uh, natural you know, births, deaths, people moving into that community or leaving that community that you're studying. And so uh, we do also have uh, the variation in nodes. This actually creates huge problems for a lot of analysis techniques. Um, if you're going to compare two different time periods, it would be nice if all the agents were the same. If you're going to ask, you know, what the network structure looks like, 
if, if at two different time periods you have different agents, then clearly they're different. They can't not be different. So you need to have some way of handling that. Um, one easy way for analysis is just to take the union of all agents who are there in any time period that you're comparing. Um, and if they weren't actually communicating in the time period of interest, just have them with no network ties. Um, the, the best choice kind of depends on what question you're trying to answer by doing the analysis. Um, but so that's one to, to deal with. Um, we can we can broadly classify um, an observation about a time period into four categories. We can classify stability is a time period that's generally no change. It's the same as our background baseline response. Um, evolution we talked about is always happening um, in a short time data set. We can ignore evolution. Um, but over the long, if we're doing something long haul, we have to take it into account. There are shock changes, and that is what we're generally looking for. And the last one, mutation, is actually a combination response. That's shock plus evolutionary behavior. Evolution happens much more quickly after a shock. Why? Because, like, for example, um, in, in Haiti, nobody could find water after the earthquake. And uh, suddenly there's all these uh, people on Twitter helping uh, provide websites or, 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 or other sorts of online support to help people find places where they are did have water. And so things like that grew up very, very fast. And we call those mutations. OK, now one thing this is a, a an aside but it's it's important before we get too far into this in human social networks when we say there's a tie normally we mean there's communication between these two agents um that's essentially what we usually mean by the word tie tie could be other things though um they could have a a, a family relationship they might never talk to each other, but they could be, you know, brothers or, or uh, father and son or father and daughter or whatever. So there's there's clearly a lot of different possibilities that that go on. But in this discussion, I'm pretty much focused on saying we're trying to treat a tie as a propensity to interact. And so one question one might ask is, where do we get data on that? And the answer is we look at people interacting through through uh, mechanisms where we can track them. That would be sending an email message, for example, at least from a system where we have underlying control of the, the infrastructure, we can see the email traffic. Um, it could be using a cell phone if we have a way of monitoring the data flow from the service provider um, it could be using Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare, any of whom allow uh, certain types of access to the transactions that individuals carry out. Um, if you work in certain buildings, you're being monitored all the time. Um, if you wear an RFID tag badge, then people can track where you are at any given point in time. So lots and lots of different ways of knowing where people are uh, what kind of communications they're carrying out. And a lot of times we get our data by having set up some way where we can access uh, that, that communication data. One question we should ask is just, you know, is it reasonable to actually look at communication data from a cell phone provider as a proxy for a tie? Well, we actually had um, uh, a, uh, a study done uh, where, where we had uh, a class at Notre Dame were given cell phones for free. They didn't have to pay for the service plan, 
Um, but the, what, the way they paid was by having their data monitored. So the, the, the entire, uh, or a good fraction of the class in four dorms agreed to join the study and they were tracked through three semesters, four semesters, sorry. And uh, they were also surveyed to ask, you know, who are you likely to interact with? Um, and we can actually see that if you just look at the number of text messages sent between pairs of people and the answer to their survey, that we could predict who they would rank in their top 10 people you would interact with just by looking at their text messages. And that's actually, I mean, it's not 100%, but over 60% of the time, we could correctly predict this just using the text message data trail. So nothing perfect there. Uh, and of course, this was a particular cohort for which text messaging was a very prominent form of communication. I, I will point out that the whole problem here is that you're estimating propensity to interact using only one mode real networks, real people walking around, they can interact face to face, they can interact by sending other communication mechanisms that you don't see. So it's it's dangerous to rely on just one communication mechanism, but it's encouraging that at least this did a fairly good job of matching the self-reported propensity to interact that these participants filled out. Okay. All right. So, so looking at communication log data, Twitter data, that sort of thing, at least in principle, it gives us an insight as to the propensity to interact between agents. So next, we've got some kind of data log. We went out, we, we negotiated an agreement with someone, we got a data log. What are we going to do then? Well, we want to be able to build networks and and determine you know whether there's been a change over time or not the first thing we have to do is if we get data for example say email data if we have uh, an email data set and and what we're going to do is is look for uh say uh, uh we're, we're in, in that email data set, we're, we're trying to build windows in time, we're building a network, but every one of those email headers really just says at a particular date and time. So we have timestamp to data. So lots of ways we can take timestamp to data and make networks. Uh, approach one is cumulative. So take all the data you have up until the current moment in time and aggregate all of it and that build a network. It turns out this is the way people do it for citation networks, because if A cited B in the past, then it's very highly likely A will cite B in the future. That citation doesn't wear out or, or go away. Um, uh, approach two is one I'll use in an example in a little bit. Um, and that's where there was a external shock that you know about. And when you have that external shock and you already know when it happened, you can basically divide the data into pre-shock, during shock, and after shock. And then you can compare the network data set you build in those regions. Very often we're collecting data, but we don't know when anything's happening. And in that case, the typical approach is to divide the data into uniform periods, like the example I gave earlier, where every four hours I aggregate all the timestamps that came in within that four hour window. I assemble them into a network and that gives me a picture of the network during that four hours. Uh, the last one is called streaming, where every time a new timestamp shows up. I update my network. And we'll talk about how to do streaming as well. Streaming is valuable when you're in an application where the time from when new data shows up until you make a decision is, is critical. All right, so 
we call that slicing and dicing because it's really how do we slice up all these timestamped data things. Any of these communication logs are generally timestamped. So the easiest way to think of this is I'm sliding a window along. I, I basically, the window is some time period wide and, and I'm gonna pick it up and move it forward by uh, that time period. So I'm gonna take this window and I'll move it forward and then I'll move it forward and then I'll move it forward Whoops, sorry. So keep moving it forward. And if there is a communication that is logged inside this window, I put a tie between the particular individuals interacting in that communication in my network for this time period. And if it was before that, I only include these ones. And if it's afterwards, I'll only include the ones over here. So we get separate networks for every time period this way. If you picked a measure, say, the because I just want to plot something scalar here, if you picked a measure like between the centrality of a particular agent and, and it was constant, unchanging over time, and then at a point in time, it suddenly made a dramatic change. That person became much more important in the network all of a sudden. One thing I want to point out is if you take a sliding window and you slide it, that, and you calculate the betweenness centrality on that network of this agent, even though it changed instantly right here in time, that betweenness centrality, because as the window slides along here, it's it's half in time before his betweenness changed and half in time after, that means it's going to change gradually to first order, just a linear slope on average. So that when the window is completely passed, when this window is completely past the change, now all of the data inside the window is at the high point. So now you'll get presumably the high value out. So that's a very simple picture, but it illustrates the idea that you, you, you want to pick a window back here because you don't want it to be too long or else you will have the problem that you're going to smear out any change. You don't want it to be too short either. If you look at the little arrows here are representing kind of the standard deviation of this measure. The standard deviation is small when the window is big and it's much bigger when the window is small. Just think about it. If I have a small window, even though there's a propensity to interact between agent I and agent J, if I only grab a small window of time, there's a high probability that they just won't happen to have interacted in that time. So there'll be many missing, what, I, what we call missing ties. So there is a tie between these two agents, but in this data set, in this network at this time slice, it won't show up because the time slice just didn't happen to catch, you know, they don't interact every minute or something. And so if the time slice is only an hour, maybe they just didn't interact in that hour. And so there's a very high statistical variation to the time, to, to each network you build for short time slices and a much smaller one. If you have longer time slices, the variance is much smaller. So, that means that we can detect more slowly changes, but we can detect smaller changes, or we could detect more quickly changes, but with a tremendous amount of background noise. So they would have to be big changes. Okay, so that's the trade-off. We can change the window that we're going to collect data in, make it longer, make it shorter. We can actually have a detector that's running on a short window to catch some really Herculean event, but catch it quickly, and a longer window that's catching some more subtle event. Nothing says we have to do the entire thing with the same window. If you're into the mathematics, of this, there are things that can even get you a slightly better trade-off between the 
length of time and the uh, standard deviation of the network. Um, for example, exponentially weighted moving average is a better window than a rectangular window. It, it gradually makes older things less and less weighted and more recent things are more heavily weighted. Whereas of course the, the window weights everything in it equally. But I will point out that although this is mathematically better, it's not enough better to drive the people who build tools to actually use it because there's a tremendous simplicity in treating all of these points the same. In fact, especially if you're doing the this incremental sliding window that I was talking about, if I just slide the window along, all I have to do is recompute whatever measures and whatever network I'm building. I just have to recompute my network based on new network ties that arrived and based on subtracting off any old network tie that just departed, like this one here had just departed and this one just arrived as I slid over. And so you just have to have a way of incrementally adding and subtracting ties and then updating your your network. So incremental uh, network analysis tools um, always use a sliding window technique. OK. So change detection, we're just looking for shocks. We talked about that. One other detail that I want to point out, though, is we also want to identify the point in time at which the change occurred. Analysts always care about that because they want to relate the change in network behavior to something in the real world. So they're going to go look in newspaper stories or something for what happened at about this time. All right. So here's the big problem. If I'm going to look at a network and say, oh, this network's changed, but what I know is networks are always different. Just two different time slices are different because a different subset of people who were who are tied together happen to bother communicating during that time period on the communication medium that I happen to be watching. So that doesn't mean they're not tied together anymore. That just means I don't get the data from that link during this time period. And so I if I just look at the data, every network looks different. I'll show you some data on that in a minute. If every network looks different, I need to have some baseline understanding of, well, how much different would networks like this be? It's, you know, I, I need a null hypothesis. It, 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 is this network different enough that I would say something must have happened? Or is it just different the way networks are normally different? And, and it has to be in context. I can't just answer this question for all time. It, it depends on what kind of time slice I used, what kind of community I'm collecting data from. It depends on what observation modality I have. So this is something that has to be determined by study. OK, now we can do some theoretical work on this. And so if we just said I have a network and I'm going to add ties to it, there's a whole lot of theory about that. And we'll talk about that fairly quickly. Um, for example, if if we think of the, the paradigm of building up a network by adding on nodes and connecting them up, um, there's a lot of ways we might want to add nodes on. Um, homophily, I mentioned earlier, uh, the different needs like the you need the expertise they have you need to work with someone you need to coordinate with them um, preferential attachment uh, proximity distance um, there's all kinds of reasons why you might make connections with people but i'll tell you the most commonly used one for this particular application is just random you assume that ties get added randomly to a network and so then the question is, if ties get re added randomly and die off randomly at some rate, you can statistically estimate how much a network might change between two time periods. And that's a 
simple, you know, random probability of link being there, being destroyed or a link being added. And that's nice because it's pretty easy to do some statistical calculations that tell you whether this network is different than that network or not. And it's not very good. It doesn't match human networks very well, but it's the one we use anyway. Um, so this is a random graph models. You've probably heard of Erdos Reni. That's the guys who first proposed this for this application. Um, and, and really, it has some interesting properties. Um, the expected value of the degree of the first node, the highest node is order log n. Um, the max degree is also order log n. And uh, the expected value of nodes with degree k is order one half to the k. This, by the way, does not generate a power law. If you've heard people say humans obey a power law, um, yes, that's true. This curve, if you plot a power law on log log, it has to come out as a straight line and the slope tells you the power. Um, you can see here the proportion of nodes with degree D relative to the degree D plotted log log is not a straight line. That's why I say this is not gonna give you a power law. Um, still, it is easy to do mathematical comparisons of and decide whether something is statistically possible or not using this kind of technique. Um, other things to take into account relate more to how humans really interact. Um, Hyderian balance, for example, when links are positive and negative, Hyderian balance tells us something about how those links work. Now, if your links are just your propensity to interact, I'm not saying whether you interact by shouting at someone or, or, or you know, uh, how you're interacting with them, uh, positive or negative. And so uh, it, 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 this is a different kind of network and you have to be more, this is more like if I ask, I did a survey and asked, do you like this person or hate them or don't care about them? Give me zero minus one plus one. Um, Blau exchange. Um, also is a way of adjusting ties that depends on your local connections. So you're more likely to add ties when in a triadic relationship. Homophily is the one we mentioned before. You have a mental model of similarity to other people and you're going to be more likely to interact with other people who are more similar with you, and more similar with your mental model of them. Um, and so that's important. And so you can have relative similarity on knowledge. And that's, this is basically saying, what do I know? What do I think? What are my opinions, my views? And compare the relative number of views I have that are the same relative to the universe of views. Um, and it's relative because you're choosing who to interact with. So, you know, if, if no one's very similar to you, you'll still find the person who's most similar. Um, if you're in a job, you may need a certain expertise. So, so then you're more driven to find the person to interact with who has that expertise relative to all other expertises. Um, and, and it's relative because again, you'll take the person who knows the most about the thing you're trying to do, even if they're not really the expert. So this is uh, all, all ways of, of applying homophily. Um, another whole theme for human networks is the rich get richer. Um, and, and the rich get richer is an interesting model. It basically says when you add a new node, it, it doesn't just randomly attach onto the existing nodes. It, it has a higher probability of attaching to a node that already has more attachments. And so this preferential attachment uh, theory, which will give you either the Yule or the Matthew effect, depending on which uh, literature you're looking at, um, does have some issues. You have to set some limits because eventually the central node will not be able to accept any more nodes. So that that changes it a little. But so we can just say that probability is proportional to the degree. 
normalized by all the degrees to make it a probability. And simple example of preferential attachment. Um, you, you, you start out with one node, you add a new node, it's only got one person to attach to, so you connect to him. Um, you add a third node, he can look at two nodes, he sees that node one has three in and out, total degree of three, node two only has a total degree of one, so he has a three-fourths and a one-fourth probability of adding. So let's say he added to node one, so now we add a fourth node. Again, you can just calculate the probabilities based on the total degree. And so you can build networks this way, and they tend to have uh, uh, this preferential attachment, follows a Yule distribution, and the big thing about it is it tends to have a power law type curve. Why is that important? Because if we look at real data sets, so, so this is, this is the, the uh, data for real data sets, citation data, internet connection data, scientific collaboration networks, actor collaboration networks. We see that these do follow a straight line on log log. And so it is the case that we want to be able to build artificial networks that will match this real data better. Uh, preferential attachment gives us that same kind of behavior. Um, it also gives us uh, the square root of n uh, the, for the expected degree of the first node. Uh, that's assuming it hasn't uh, hit its upper limit yet. And uh, it always gives us a power law distribution. And so it's closer to real graphs. Is it is it right on? No. Um, there's some other issues that it misses. So the most existing models, the number of edges grows linearly with the number of nodes. But that would mean the diameter grows at a rate of log n or log of the log n. But if we look at real graphs, that's not what they do. Real graphs grow exponentially with a densification exponent. So over time, they get denser. Alpha is bigger than one in general for human networks. If you look at science citation data, you get an alpha there that's like 1.69. If you look at the internet, you get 1.18. But, but that means that real nets, the distance between people as it gets bigger and bigger, gets smaller and smaller. So the effective diameter, which is sort of how many hops you have to go to get 90% of the way between any pair, of, and 90% of all node pairs are reachable in that many hops. And as the network gets bigger, there's more edges per node. And so the number of hops gets smaller, even though the network is getting bigger. And so it turns out that the preferential attachment networks don't do this. And so we look at these real networks and we say, oh, so we're not going to get this, not going to get the match for the long term changes in these networks with preferential attachment. So if you really want to do this as best, the, the, the best model I know of right now is called the forest fire model. So here we, we add a node, it connects to another node randomly chosen. And then it starts connecting the through or burning nodes and fires a link to each node that it connects to. And there's a probability of whether it's going to connect. Each time it connects, it adds a link to that. This forest fire type model, which builds denser connections, um, can achieve a densification factor. For example, this one's tuned to match the densification of the internet. So it's almost the 1.18, here's 1.21. And the diameter shrinks. And so forest fire models can give you uh, the, the, the density change with time that we expect. They also generate heavily tailed, uh, but still uh, you can see their, their power laws still as well. So 
These are very good matches to human data, but I will say we use random link models most of the time. So forest fire models can actually give you a pretty good match to real human data across a wide range of properties. But be careful, that still doesn't mean they're as complicated as humans. For example, if I took a human network that looked like this, this is a cellular network with one sort of central controller. Now you might say, what happens if you grab the central controller and remove them? Oop. So we've now taken out the central controller. Well, if this was preferential attachment or random reconnection, this wouldn't mean much, but really these two cells were communicating. They are aware of each other at some level. So they're going to try to reconnect. And so these agents are going to be reaching out for agents on the other side of the link. Eventually, one of them will make a connection here. And that connection will bring these two subgroups back together into communication. So 39 will become the new hub and we'll start connecting up to everyone else on the right hand group. And so now we have a new uh, central point. And we can think of that as uh, healing. So, so human networks, humans can directedly look for particular attachments that have properties that they want. So they can direct their network attention in a way that none of these mathematical approaches to building networks can really simulate. Okay. All right, so that was the idea. Like I said, I, from now on, we're just going to use random graphs. So let's pop back up to the high level and talk about comparing groups. Just to recapitulate what I talked about, our, our strategy is to divide the data up into time periods, windows. We aggregate the data in each window into a network. Now, we have a lot of choices here. We could visualize the data in each window and compare them visually. That works for small data sets. The human eye is remarkably sensitive at catching changes in patterns. And so that could be a strategy we would adopt. But if you have a big data set, that's really not going to work too well for you. Um, we can, if we have a bigger data set, we can try using grouping algorithms to, whoops, to form smaller groups. Um, and, and so that's a, a simpler way. Um, we might see changes in groups then. And lastly, at the end, we're going to talk about using measures on the network for this. Um, I have a, a, a simple example here that's related to a NATO exercise that was run back in 2018. In the middle of this NATO exercise, there was a crash in which a uh, Norwegian uh, ship was the Helga Instad was damaged. And uh, so we could say, oh, that was a special event. It generated a lot of interest on this within the traffic related to this NATO exercise. Um, the ship was involved in a NATO exercise in the NATO exercise at the time. So we could divide uh, our data set up into the day prior to the crash, the day of the crash, and the day after the crash to see did that crash cause any change in terms of the social media data traffic. This was looking at Twitter. Okay. And then can we visualize that? Does that help us? Okay, so we do that. And um, I think the day of the crash looks slightly busier, but um, my eyeball can't really tell me a whole lot about this. Any way you look at it, it's pretty busy, but there are a lot more points in the middle, I would say. Um, so let's use grouping algorithms. So we can we can run grouping algorithms uh, on on every each of these three data periods. Um, for a larger data set, we prefer to run Louvain 
uh, which is one particular grouping style. And we can look at those groups. Um, lots and lots of ways to look at groups. We could look at the key agents who are the most uh, central agent in each group. Um, this is the, 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 the tightest group and the key agent within the tightest group. Interestingly, YouTube was the key agent on the day of the crash. That's because these pictures of the ship, uh, there was a whole video on YouTube. So everyone was pointing at the YouTube video of the ship. Um, and, and so that's, that's the idea. Um, we can look at the external to internal link count. Um, but what I would point out to you here is, is when I just look at it, the, the period of a day, it's like there's a few links between these two, a few of the uh, people show up in both, but to first order, it's kind of like random. I, I, I wouldn't be able to say that before and after were any different than uh, before and day of crash. And so this is the problem with the group comparison is it's, it's actually really hard to compare groups. All right. Okay. So that leads me into the last half of my talk, which is it's, it's hard to do it visually, at least for big data. It's hard to use groups because even though grouping algorithms can reduce the complexity, it's, we don't know what the groups are. So it's not like there's any free labeling. It just gives you groups that are somewhat cohesive. Uh, and it gives you a score for the cohesiveness ratio of internal to external uh, ties. But that may not be very helpful in terms of making a decision about whether there was some major change in the network at a particular time slice or not. I'll propose one for this example that's really simple. Count the number of tweets. Okay, that's a measure that came in in a time window. If I look at the day before the crash, uh, about 4,800 and some. The day of the crash, 27,800 and some tweets. The day after the crash, 4,115 tweets. Okay. I could say it doesn't take a brilliant algorithm to look at those three numbers and go, something weird happened on the day of the crash it seems to be dramatically different in terms of total traffic. Okay, so that's just an example, but what it suggests is that if we pick measures of the network, so we're gonna calculate something about the network, the total betweenness, the total degree, the, you know, any of the, uh, you know, we have like 180 network measures that we use all the time. Calculate any of those network measures you want um, about the network and look at that as an overtime variable. And then once you've done that, follow that up and see if that overtime variable is what you want and can tell you and give you insight as to when change that's important to you occurs. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And, and this is fundamentally based on the idea that statistics can be used here. We're going to assume that random network link model. And so that the, the probability of a link is just a probability. It's not dependent on any of the presence or absence of links adjacent to it. It doesn't depend on the mental model of other people. It's just a random probability number. And, and then we can assume in a given time period, based on the link probabilities, whether or not, you know, is it likely that that link just might not show up? We can calculate that now. Um, and that'll give us our network. And then we're gonna apply some measure on this network that itself has 
a lot of variability because the links might or might not get seen in a particular time period. And that'll give us a measure that has statistical variation itself over time. And now we want to look at deciding, well, when we see a change in the measure, can we decide how big a change we should flag as a underlying change in the network? We'll come back to the problem of pattern of life variations. They are important and we have a solution that we use for them and we'll talk about that too. So that's kind of where we're going in the last half of this lecture. Um, so here's a plot of a measure. You could look at points A and B and C and then D and say, something odd might have happened at point D, don't you think? It certainly looks unusual compared to its neighbors. Um, so that's the kind of thing we want to be able to do. But now we're not looking at networks at multiple time slices. We're looking at a measure that we calculate on a network at every single one of those time slices. And the typical approach is, is based on what's called statistical process control. And this literally dates back to Ford Motor Company championed the creation of statistical process control back when they were first making Model Ts. And they had this problem that they were making cars using parts that came off of multiple different machining lines. And they wanted all of them to be able to be assembled and work. So they had to control the statistical variations of a manufacturing line. And, and what happened was machines would wear out, things would stop working. And then if they happened to put them in a different car, it wouldn't work. And so they formulated an entire method which basically characterized those machines as, as basically having an underlying mean and standard deviation and being a random number generator. So think of a Gaussian generator. And uh, then they watched this, the actual machines. They tested them periodically to see if they suddenly had drifted outside an acceptable range. So that was the idea of statistical process control. Now, if you said, OK, I need to know the mean and the standard deviation of the networks, then you could start to go back to that link probability model. So the link probability model is the integral over the duration of a window from the beginning of the window to the end of the window of the probability that there will be a communication on this communication channel that we're watching between a particular pair of agents. And that is a link probability. And so that'll we can assemble link probabilities into networks by randomly spinning up networks where there's connections that are simply in proportion to the probability. We can do whatever measure analysis we want on those networks in order to calculate a density or a, a betweenness or a, any, any network measure we want to calculate. And then we can do an overtime analysis on that measure. So that's the basic underlying idea of the statistical underpinning. And so if you're into probability theory, you presumably uh, have heard of a Gaussian. And since they're assuming independent identical distributions, all uh, a sum of independent identically distributed random variables always ends up being approximately Gaussian. And so uh, we end up with measures that, for the most part, depend on many different network ties that have a binary distribution. They're either there or not. And so we end up with a Gaussian. And our Gaussian distribution has tails. The white areas out here in the corners are the tails. So there's some probability, even, even if it's not a real event, there's some probability that this machine, even though it's working normally, will every now and then throw out something way out here in these tails. 
and that's called a, 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 a false positive. And so we have a probability for a false positive error. So we we say it's a we say it's a change, but in fact, it wasn't a change. It was just the way random networks bounce around. And so there wasn't any fundamental change here. It was just the statistical process of missing a bunch of links caused you to change your measure enough to think it was out here somewhere. And so we set our threshold for how far out that has to be in the end based on that false positive probability. Okay? So 95% says this is that this picture here. This says 95% of the time we're in the gray area. So two and a half percent of the time we're in one tail or the other. Okay, so the earliest one that uh, control method that we know of is, is called Schuart. And uh, Schuart basically proposed a very simple scheme. They translated the distribution of the whatever the mean and standard deviation of the tool was, they subtracted the mean and divided by the standard deviation. So they created a normal variable, um, meaning a zero mean one variance variable. And, and then when they did that, they could just plot a simple chart and say, well, if I'm willing to tolerate so many false positives, then I, I set a, a, a threshold negative or positive because because the mean is in the middle right you can your 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 tool can spit out something that's way above the mean or it's way below the mean and either way it's an error and so you put these red bars here and and, and you basically flag anything out here as oh there's an error or oh there's an error or change in our case so this was Schuart. Schuart basically just uses this normalization, standard uh, uh, Gaussian normalization. But there's a really big trick here. It's extremely difficult, especially for most of the measures that we use, to think about how you could theoretically calculate, even if you could measure all the link probabilities for the link probability model, it would be really, really hard to take that, those probability distributions through the network calculation. Think of something like betweenness, which is, you know, how many shortest paths are you on? That's not a simple linear sum or something that you could do in probabilities. So, Schuart had the same problem with the Ford Motor Companies. These machines were very nonlinear, uh, very, very difficult to calculate the fundamental underlying distributions on. So they didn't. Their whole insight was, I make a whole bunch of measurements on this machine and I save them and I collect them. And I basically use the observations when the machine's working properly in a sample statistics sense. So I don't have to calculate the underlying distribution of the motor vibrating or the drill bit changing or temperature varying this or that doesn't matter. I don't need to know all that. Just like I don't really need to know how the network link probabilities are changing. All I need to know is on my measure, what's the mean for my measure when things are normal? What's the standard deviation for my measure when things are normal? And so we do that just by simply saying, hey, I'm going to look at some number of points here, in this case, seven points. And I will calculate the mean and standard deviation based on those seven points. And from that, I will subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation to normalize the variable. And then I will look at this next point and say, is it two standard deviations away? And the answer would be no. And then you could slide this whole thing over and now take this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, and this point, and take those seven points, calculate the mean standard deviations, subtract it off, and then look at this point and say, is that one reasonable? And the answer would still be, yeah, sure, 
and this one, yeah, sure. And then if you take these seven from here to there, to there, to there, to there, and calculate the mean and standard deviation, and then you look at this one, you'd say, holy crap, what happened? Okay, so this you would flag as a change. So the shoe art basically slides along the the change signal, the slides along the, the baseline you use to calculate the mean and standard deviation. It's a sample statistic, but it's one that keeps on moving along. So if you have a very slow change over time in your underlying data set, like evolution normally gives us, it doesn't flag as an error here because we keep adapting the mean. And as long as it changes slowly, it'll never trip the change detector. So that's how Shuart works. It's It completely gets around having to actually understand the link probabilities for all the people and their variance and everything. And focuses instead on just using sample statistics to calculate the probabilities of the measure mean and standard deviation, which is what we need anyway in order to calculate whether it's a change. So this is great. This saves us a huge amount of pain. So we can go on and 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 calculate these. It does assume that our observations are normally and independent random variables. Um, and, and so not that there's a correlation between samples in time. There's newer ways of doing this. So there's something called scan statistic from Fisher. There's exponentially weighted moving average. Um, when I say newer, you see these are like 1934, 1959. This is a well-studied field that's been around for a long time in the manufacturing world. Uh, QSUM is another one. QSUM is particularly interesting because QSUM takes whatever you calculated as the metric last time and adds it in to the next calculation. And, and what that means is this one actually uh, carries out effectively integration. So this one would have the problem that in QSUM, here's an example. If, if, if I had an input data set that had no change, you get random variations. If I have an input data set where the mean drops right at this time 25, if that drop was small enough, Shuart would never report a change. If, if that drop didn't initially cause a change signal, th then it never would. QSUM, even if it didn't initially cause a change, say the threshold was set way up at 50, even if it didn't initially cause a change, it keeps integrating and integrating, and so eventually you see a change detection. So these are all various kinds of change detection. This is on a whole bunch of different data sets. Um, and, and we can actually just look at pictures and go, oh, wow. So these are cool ways of detecting change. Um, and so we, we, we did, each of these lines is saying, oh, look, I have a change detection here and here. And so we can detect change detection here uh, on, on a lot of these different data sets. One really important thing to understand, false alarm, the, the probability of a false positive or a false alarm is very important. In all these data sets, we, we set these red lines higher or lower. And if the red line, whoops, sorry. If the red line is higher, what we're saying is, well, it has to be a more unusual event. We're going to be further out in the tail of that Gaussian. And you'll get fewer false alarms. You also be more and more likely to miss positives. So you'll get a false negative, meaning you'll say, nope, no change there, because you set the threshold so high. So there's always a tension between where where you set this threshold will be uh, a problem. So you 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 either want you you want to typically keep setting the threshold lower until if, if you're in a, a group of analysts, a human analyst is going to look at the data every time a, an alarm goes off. And if you have too many false alarms, your human analysts run out of time to do the work. 
but you kind of want to set the false alarm level low enough that you're keeping your analysts busy because that gives you the within the resource constraint you have that gives you the lowest possible likelihood of missing a, a, something that you should have alarmed on uh, in this data set. So that's an important trade-off. So all these techniques, Shuart and QSUM, uh, EWMA, they all offer you the chance to set uh, where that false alarm probability is. And the smaller you set it, that corresponds to the higher up in terms of the normalized Gaussian the signal has to be in order to cause an alarm. Okay. Now let me move on to the last little bit I had. In some data sets, over time, pattern of life uh, variations can be large. Like that first one I showed you where the, if the time slices are short enough, the networks can be dramatically different. And, and, and so when you apply any measure on those networks, you're going to see a huge spike and, and, and you will never be able to detect changes in the presence of that, or you'll constantly signal changes, or you'll raise the false alarm probability so, so that that uh, it, it is so many standard deviations that it never trips. How do you deal with that? Well, we have two problems. We have to figure out what the periodicities are that the underlying data set shows us, and we have to remove them. Now, in this case, here I'm going to talk about using uh, Fourier transforms to help do that and some nonlinear filtering theory. So what's a Fourier transform? Okay, uh, this is just mathematical technique that says I can decompose any overtime signal into a sum of sinusoidal signals with different amplitude, frequency, and phase. Um, remember Fourier series, maybe uh, that's the sort of thing this comes out of. So we can do a Fourier transform. Basically, here's my, my picture. If, if, if you think of having a, a waveform, this is my real waveform over time. I can say if I have this these three sine waves, uh, at the appropriate amplitude and with the appropriate phase shifts at the appropriate, these three frequencies added together. And you can see this is a low frequency, a middle frequency and a high frequency. But if you add them all together, you get this complex waveform. And the Fourier transform does the, you can put this waveform in and the Fourier transform finds exactly what the phase and, and uh, uh, magnitude of each frequency needs to be to add up to this. So the Fourier transform is very useful for figuring out what are the underlying periodicities that are in my measure. So any measure that I've taken over time, I can basically decompose it into periodic cyclic events. For example, so here's a basic sine wave and you can see it if you take an FFT of it, you get a impulse. Uh, all of the energy is at one frequency. In this case, it's at half or at a quarter. I'm sorry. Um, if we take a random variable signal like this and do an FFT, we might discover that there's this frequency, which has a period of one fourth of the sample period and another one at one point over 0.3 or 3.33 of a sample period. So we often talk about cycles. So we'll talk about periods. And so we'll do some examples like that. So this naturally shows that the FFT analysis by itself is a way of finding dominant frequency components. All right, let's look at a real example because the real data is good to look at. Here's a data called ICNET-3. It's data from 24 cadets in a regimental chain of command. They had their emails monitored as part of a class. Um, and so we're just plotting here is uh, the agent-to-agent uh, -agent emails 
uh, normalized uh, per day. So this is just showing you how much email traffic happened per day. Clearly something a little unusual out here is going on, right? There's, there's a lot more traffic here. This is 0 0.7, 0 0.35, more than 2x more traffic here than back here. Wonder what happened. So we could try to apply our technique for detecting this. We could take this data, overtime data. We have a measure. In this case, the measure is just the number of uh, emails sent. Um, we could uh, use a Fourier transform. And what would we see? Here's, here's the actual picture of the Fourier transform of that time data. Now, this Fourier transform isn't very appealing to most uh, network analysis people. First, what is the frequency? Why is 0.5 the highest frequency? Because uh, there's a, a theorem that uh, called the Nyquist theorem, which says you can't represent a frequency above the sample rate. And so uh, in, in the Fourier transform, this is all normalized to the sample rate. Uh, in this case, the sample rate is one sample per day. So this is a, a frequency of 0.5 would be something that has a cycle that takes two days to cycle. That's the fastest repetitive thing you can see in this data set, something with two days to cycle. Something here at 0.25, this, this spike is telling us that it takes four days to cycle. So something that takes four days to cycle. This one down here at a, a little below 0.15, that's taking seven days to cycle. Now, clearly, if you wanna think about it, um, there's also a big spike down here, but this record is only 30 days long. It turns out it, it, when you get down below um, uh, something like, uh, this is 20 days, th this right here, oh, this is like 20 days per cycle. When you start to get to within half of the length of the entire record, you get big artifacts. So this is just an artifact. <coughs> But this is actually telling us that the data set itself has strong periodicity, pattern of life periodicity here, here, and here, and maybe weaker here. We can actually plot these as periods. So I can just, this is the same exact plot flipped over. So I'm now plotting it as periods. Since the original sample rate was one sample per day, then these are each per days. So you can see the first data point here is two per day, and then three per day, and then there's a huge spike at four per day, or I'm sorry, that's three per day, and then there's four per day, and then there's seven per day, and then this is that artifact that I mentioned. So if you looked in at this, the three per day and the seven per day are the big repeats, the, this is telling you the coefficient squared, that's the A in front of it. So this is A squared for this sine wave and this sine wave and this sine wave. We could maybe keep this one in or not. It's not a lot smaller, 0.075 versus 0 0.063. Okay, so we might keep those, but this is much smaller, like a factor of two smaller. Okay. So here's the idea. First, I should point out, just looking at a plot like this is a way of finding out about the patterns. One thing here, we are not at all surprised, students taking classes, uh, seven day pattern makes sense, right? You have weekends, weekends are different than class days normally and everything. We were totally surprised to see that there's a three day pattern that's just as strong. Why? Well, it turns out we asked the students involved here in the military and they had a three day rotation. So there was a natural three day periodicity that was actually part of the system. And so those two, this one was the normal weekly periodicity, but then this one was driven by the company rotation schedule. 
okay, that was interesting. So we found that without knowing anything about it. We just looked at the data. Okay, so that's very cool. It lets you find periodicities you don't even know about in your data. Now we want to get rid of them. If, if we want to get rid of those periodicities, then what we have to do is, is we can take an FFT and look at those spikes and decide to only keep the ones that represent the pattern of life. Then we can do an inverse Fourier transform and subtract that time waveform from our signal. So here's an example. Oh, come on. Up, up. So here's an example where where we have literally just kept the three, the four, and the seven. Uh, well, and these guys are just the artifact. So we just keep them. All the other values we've set to zero. We now do the inverse Fourier transform, and that gives us this blue wave, or it gives us a waveform. And if we subtract it from this red waveform, we get the blue waveform. Now, you look at this and you say, oh, there's a lot less variability going on here. And that makes sense because it turns out the underlying pattern of life is, is accentuating some of these peaks and reducing some of the others. In, in, in the blue one, I want to argue that the blue one is better for doing pattern detection on. Well, OK, let's see. Is it really? OK, so if I do Schuart, and I say the first 10 networks are in control and I give myself a 5% false probability, false alarm probability, which is very typical numbers. And I look at this, I see, oh my gosh, I mean, there's the, like a third of the data points are alarmed. So I, I'd have false alarms going off all the time. If, if, if I only wanted a few false alarms with this data set, I'd have to set the threshold like way up here, twice as high um, to get, then I would just get these two points, but I would be much less sensitive to any other changes. Now, if I instead go on and said, here's doing the same thing on the blue waveform. So I'm back to the this blue waveform where I've subtracted off my resynthesized pattern of life variation. So I take that and I now do Schuart on that. And I see now with the same threshold, same 10 networks in control, same 5% risk factor, I pick up an unusual negative day here. The amount of email communication was unusually low right here. Another unusually low communication day and then an unusually high communication day. Okay. And it turned out those had relationships to some real events we could double check this was far far more accurate generating far less false negatives or false positives and the threshold is much lower we stayed stayed with that too which means we can maintain that high sensitivity so we we can remove some pattern of life background and achieve uh, a, 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 we can sustain a high sensitivity without being overwhelmed by false positives Okay, so that's just an example, but essentially it shows you how Fourier analysis and nonlinear filtering can be used to smooth out pattern of life variations. The Fourier analysis part helps you identify the periodic data trends that are in your longitudinal network data. The analyst can play with them and decide which ones to remove, try removing different ones, seeing how much it helps. We can invert the Fourier transform of the ones that are identified as significant in order to synthesize a uh, estimate of the background periodic activity and then subtract that. Um, the overall process of detection of change on measures is very scalable. Why? Because Essentially, the hard work is carrying out calculation of the metrics on the networks because the networks are much, much bigger. But as soon as we carry out, even if we wanted to track 20 metrics, 
uh, measures, still we've reduced an entire network down to just 20 numbers. And so uh, there are some issues with smaller networks. Networks with say less than 20 nodes tend to have very high variance in our overtime measures. And so it's very difficult to get uh, a, a reasonably reasonable standard deviation for our measures. So we don't want super short time windows. Typically we need medium sized time windows and the Fourier transform techniques only work well when there are many time periods. We, we would like 30 time periods, which is the example I showed you, is actually about as short as it could be. We'd really prefer to have 100 time periods or more. So for the Fourier technique to work, you need a lot of overtime data, many points. But to get good variance, the windows can't be too short. So in a sense, you need a lot of record. The one other thing about the Fourier transform is you have to have an expert who can look at the data and tell you, well, where is your baseline? Because if you're in the middle of a change and you use that to estimate the mean and the variance, well, then you're going to set your thresholds very far out and you'll never detect a new change because you called the last change part of the baseline. So you still, the, the Fourier approach always needs, uh, and, and actually even the Schuart approach, since we're using sample statistics, both of those, uh, I, I want to emphasize, you have to have an expert be able to look at that and define a, a, a period of stable a period that's not change uh, for which you can set up the calculate the mean and standard deviation of the process. And the Fourier transform can be carried out on that good period. You need all those things uh, to be able to carry out good, accurate detection. And finally, just as a last uh, concluding caution, um, Time slicing and dicing can create artifacts. One thing I strongly encourage you to do is take the same data with timestamp data and change the window sampling size and check whether or not your resulting conclusions change. That's a very, you know, if you can change the sampling size up or down by a factor of two and your conclusions stay the same about whether there's a change or not, that's a good thing. That gives you strong confidence um, that it's not just an artifact of exactly how the sampling worked. Um, you also want to watch out for network measures um, that are correlated. Uh, it's very helpful to run a complete calculation on many measures in parallel and to look and see do you know three or four of these measures suddenly say there's a change at this time period or in the same vicinity in time. Well, maybe they do because they all are based on the same correlated artifact. Um, so be careful to always investigate your conclusions carefully. Um, and so the uh, uh, that's really the my my last cautionary note. At that point, I'll I'll stop and take any questions that anyone has. Yeah, so everyone feel free to write in the chat or just unmute yourself to ask questions. So I, I had one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, you might have mentioned this, but you were talking about the forest fire model and how it was the best model right now. Um, does that exist in Aura yet? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, but I'm sure it will, I, I would expect it will be there soon, but I don't uh, actually, I haven't tried to look and see if it's there in the latest version. But you, you can do that and let me know. <laughs> I mean, I, I looked really quickly. I, I couldn't find it and thought maybe yeah. I didn't know what it was called in Aura, but. Yeah, it might have a different name. I it, I don't know. Uh... Okay. Yeah. 
I think preferential attachment may be the most uh, high fidelity model for building networks that's in Aura right now. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. So are there any other questions? not, we can go ahead and start our break until the next session. Thank you, Dr. Carley. You're very welcome. Your presentation. Thanks everyone for your attention. Um, if you do think of any questions later on, just go ahead and drop them in the chat. We'll make sure to get them relayed um, and answers out to you. So at this point, we'll take a break until 2.45.